morning, and welcome to Virtual Praise on this, the 27th of March, 2022. It is the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. I invite you now to incline your hearts and clear your minds as we go together to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. How incredible is your love, O God! We have been made new in your love and reconciled to you and to each other in peace and joy. Be with us this day as we hear your words of comfort and hope. Guide our lives that we may serve you more fully all of our days. Amen. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from St. Luke's Gospel in the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Lord, it is interesting that it is easy for us to identify with today's scripture about the prodigal son. Some of us are easily reminded of our own selfishness and stubbornness when we willfully sought our own way. Others are reminded about how angry we were when others were not held accountable for their actions, when we have been so careful not to displease anyone. Still others can identify with the father who, feeling the loss of his son, welcomes him home again, reminding the brother that he has always been in the love and care of the father. We hear this story and it's a pleasant memory, but do we really understand what it is about? Do we know that we have also been stubborn and selfish, angry and unforgiving, sorrowful and caught between two conflicting factions? We are no different from these characters in our own unique way. Yet in God's infinite love, we also are forgiven and healed. We are called to turn our lives back to God's care, which is always extended to us. Forgive us and heal us, gracious God. Open our hearts and our spirits to truly receive the blessings of your healing love. For it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, receive this assurance of pardon for our many sins. Once we were dead to all the things that God hoped for us. But in God's love, we are again brought to life. Rejoice, dear ones. You are forgiven. Amen. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Would you go with me now in prayer? Gracious Lord, we have set aside this day to celebrate Uncor Sunday, a time in which we can offer our help and our substance for the work of your kingdom and helping others. We have created a special day for this offering, yet you would have us adopt this attitude of sharing all of our days. Bring us to the understanding of the joy of sharing all that we have with others, of reaching out to others in compassion and love as you have done for us. We hear the words of scriptures about the Hebrew people who had wandered long in the wilderness. They were fed on the manna which you provided for them. At last, they were able to provide for themselves. Help us to realize that you have given us all that we need to be those who would bring peace and hope to others. Let us place our trust in you so that our sharing is a reflection of your forgiving and reconciling love. In Jesus Christ, we offer this prayer. Amen.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord. May your word be proclaimed either through me or in spite of me. I ask in the name of the living Christ. Amen. I look at this passage from Luke as a story that's in three dimensions across three different time segments. First, we have the restlessness story, and that's where the prodigal son and the father figure prominently. Next, we have the hedonism story, and that one is all about the prodigal son. And lastly, we have the redemption story, where the father and both of his sons figure prominently. Let's begin taking a look at this. We'll start, of course, with the restlessness story. The prodigal son is restless. He doesn't want the future that his father made for him. The prodigal is self-centered. He wants to escape the life expected of him, but he doesn't know how. He decides to ask for his inheritance early so he could leave without uncertainty about where his next meal was coming from. Can you imagine going to your parents and telling them that you want the cash equivalent of your share of the estate that they expect to leave behind. Do you really think that's a winning strategy? The prodigal son, he is impatient. He doesn't want to wait for his father to die. He wants to enjoy his life today. 
instead of waiting until his father's death. He only waits a few days before setting out on his adventure. But it's very likely that his father would have tried to dissuade him from leaving. It's also likely that his older brother was resentful of his younger brother's disregard for their father's feelings. Perhaps one solid lesson from this is that the seeds of envy and resentment bear fruit that is bitter and indigestible. So, the prodigal son has left, and he is out now, and we enter into the hedon of it the hedonism story. So we read that the prodigal son took off for greater parts and presumably, of course, for a better life. He took his share of his father's wealth, which was typically about one third, and he didn't look back. He established his new life. He filled it with drinking wine and living lavishly, the finest of clothes, the finest of food, and he paid for the company of prostitutes. His hedonism was in full flower, and he cannot help but crave more of the same. His life was likely focused on just one objective, how to get more money to continue riding on the self-indulgence trail that he was following. But the well of wealth eventually ran dry. And it left him vulnerable to starvation when a famine struck the region in which he was living. He realizes, I need a job. He's desperate, and he's willing to take even the most menial of jobs. In this case, feeding the pigs. And remember, that truly was menial because the Jews considered pigs to be unclean. He knew he needed to do something to support his now distant way of life. But no one gives him anything. Despite his willingness to eat what the pigs themselves are being fed, he knows that if he doesn't do something quickly, he will likely die as a result of his hedonistic and self-centered lifestyle. He feels trapped, unable to go back, and unwilling to go on. He has an epiphany of sorts, and he figures out that his salvation lies at the home that he left behind. And now we transition into the redemption story. So the prodigal son decides that it would be better for him to become a slave for his father, because they at least are fed regularly, if not sumptuously. He swallows what's left of his pride and plans to go to his father on bended knee, admitting his failures and asking to be allowed to come home in the role of a slave. His spirit is broken from the shame and remorse that he's consumed by. He acknowledges that he is unworthy of his father's mercy. But what other choice does he have? So he sets out for home. His father sees him at a distance and is immediately filled with joy at the return of this wayward son. The son is still expecting a chilly reception from the man whose wealth he squandered. He is ready to hear, I told you so, or home are you with your tail between your legs? Instead, his father rushes out, hugs him and greets him with a kiss and instructs the servants to bring their finest robe and a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. He tells them to kill the fatted calf and put together a feast to celebrate the return of his youngest son. Imagine the son's reaction to all of this. 
I would expect at least surprise. Shock would probably be more likely. That might eventually morph into relief, and that relief can become hope. Then the other shoe drops. The oldest son learns that his brother has returned. His reaction is not really a surprise. He's angry and he's hurt. He resents the reception given this lost brother by his father. I've worked hard for years, he tells him, and you never set a feast for me, not even a goat. He resents that his brother wasted all of his share of the wealth and has now come back, presumably, to get more to feed his lust for life. He won't even go into the house because he's so angry and probably quite jealous. His father comes out to him outside and pleads with him, telling him that he hasn't fallen out of the father's favor or grace, but that his brother had been dead and came back to life. He was lost and now was found. The father says, we had to celebrate. We had no choice. And that is where the parable ends. We are left without a resolution to the standoff between the two sons and between the father and the oldest son. As unsatisfying as that may be, there are still valuable lessons to be taken from this parable. The father demonstrates the immense power of mercy, forgiveness, and grace by welcoming the prodigal son home, just like God welcomes us home because of the forgiveness won through Jesus' blood. The prodigal learns that self-importance and avarice and moral weakness cannot buy happiness. We're taught from an early age that sin is empty and cannot fill whatever the whole is inside of us. Now, the oldest son proves that when the lost are found, it's experiencing joy is, in fact, a choice. Either celebrate the return of the one lost to all-consuming sin, or allow the sin of someone else's to live rent-free in your head, leading you to isolation and hard-to-shake resentment. My friends, the world as we have made it is not what God intended for us. Sin is rampant and manifests in even the most innocent of circumstances. Our culture of consumption blinds us to opportunities for mercy and grace. The returning prodigal today is frequently treated as nothing more than an entitled brat. Our faith and trust in God ebbs and flows just like our wealth does when the market goes up or the market goes down. Perhaps the most important lesson is that forgiveness, though difficult to extend and sometimes to receive, carries in it the power of the cross and the hope the empty tomb. So I say to you today, power to the prodigal. That should be our battle cry. Amen. And now my friends receive this benediction. Forgiven and beloved ones of God, go now in peace, sharing with others the good news of God's love. Help those in need. Give and receive from each other the joy of peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a safe and blessed week. I look forward to being with you again very soon. God bless.